Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us on this Wednesday, insert time of day based on your geographic location. Uh, it is so wonderful to see each of you as you are joining in. Please make sure that you are muted throughout the session. Uh, we want to make sure that all of our um, attention can be placed where it belongs, which is towards our speakers. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Manelli Manukian. I'm the executive director for the Center for Art Law. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you'll see on your screen in just a moment, a little poll for you to fill out. While I take the time to tell you about the center, we'd love to learn a little bit about you, how you found us and where it is you're dialing in from. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Center for Art Law, we are a research and education organization dedicated to offering resources and programming for the advancement of a vibrant arts and law community worldwide. Uh, through our website, our newsletter and events, we disseminate information, keep our audiences updated on all art law related news, programs, cases, publications, and even more. Uh, we also have a wonderful intern class every single semester, some of which are joining us today and have helped put together the educational materials that you'll be seeing uh, in the chat a little later. Um, a special welcome and thank you to all our premium members and those that have sponsored the events that we were having at the center today. Uh, the Center for Art Law couldn't be the success that it is without the support of other amazing art law fans in the community. So if you're interested in discounted or free access to our events or access to past uh, recordings and our case law corner, please consider signing up for a premium membership. We also invite you to, su to subscribe to our newsletter or, um, to receive updates and invitations or to visit our website at www.itsartlaw.org. And if you can make a donation to help us create even more wonderful events like this. Um, we speaking of the wonderful events that we have, we do have a few coming up on the horizon, one even being tomorrow, our primer on artist trusts. Uh, we have a series, um, that is being continued and will end in the launch of our brand new clinic. So uh, we invite you to join us in our artist dealer relationships event, um, building lasting galleries, and then to join us for the inaugural um, artist dealer relationship clinic itself. Uh, we also have our artist legacy and estate planning uh, clinic coming up with another session at the end of the month and an event next month as well on artist archives, how to build it and where to house it. Um, before we begin, a few usual housekeeping items in case you haven't noticed already, this event is being recorded for archival purposes. Feel free to turn off your camera um, and make sure to uh, remain muted to prevent any background noises from sneaking in. Uh, we would love to see your faces, however, so if you'd like to keep your camera on, we do invite you to do so. We will be taking questions after the presentations. Uh, please ask them using the Q&A chat. Uh, we will be monitoring this and putting in links and any uh, especially um, interesting articles that we find that are related to the conversations as uh, everything goes on. And a link to the handouts with bios and reading materials will be sent into the chat just shortly. Um, so now let me take the time to introduce Arena Tarsis, the founder and managing director of the Center for Art Law, who will present our speakers for today. Thank you so Manelli. Um, thank you so much. We have um, a few more people coming in and I'm looking at the results of the survey. I don't know if I want to share it with you guys or not. Um, I do. Here are they for our mutual review. Um, it's nice to see many returning visitors to the center. It's nice to see newcomers. Welcome everyone. Um, and most of the people who are joining us today are in Northeast United States. Some are artists, some are students, a fair number of lawyers and museum professionals. Um, so what are we doing today? We are still on the subject of some like a digital. And um, this series, as some of you know, was launched last year. We seem to be living um, very firmly in multiple spaces. So after discussing um, blockchain technology after discussing use of artificial intelligence for various art related purposes. Um, if you remember last time, if you were with us, we discussed meeting everybody in metaverse. Um, our speakers could not agree whether there was one metaverse or two, but they had a pretty interesting discussion. And um, today we are going from metaverse to something that seems more familiar. We're just going to www domain name 
However, I think many of you don't realize how much work and how much metaphorical brick and mortar there is behind the main names and the main name laws. Uh, we are joined by a panel of very wise, very um, clear speakers. I'm delighted um, that we have these experts um, here to explain to us uh, law behind the main names. Uh, we will talk about a case involving Meta Birkins. There's metaburkins.com domain name. There's no metaburkins.art domain name, but there is a domain name called .art. I wonder, and feel free to put into the chat how many of you have .art domain names to your name. We have some artists among us. Um, and wh whether you see a difference between using .com or .art or .ch or .nyc or any other domain name and why do you make that choices? Why do people make these choices? So our, we have two guests and they have choreographed their presentation masterfully. They will be trading off um, with the slides. Um, the first guest is Anne Gondelfinger. She has, right now she's general counsel with Unicode Consortium. You may think it's far away from the arts. It's not. Uh, her previous work was related to um, intellectual property um, global uh, intellectual property vice president for a very um, well-known design, jewelry design line. And Anne has tried to explain to me how one resolves disputes like metadbergen.com um, and other disputes that are visible or invisible in the internet verse, not metaverse. Our second speaker is Kurt Pritz. He um, right now uh, is an operations executive at Kurt Press Management Consulting, but I have um, learned of Kurt's work uh, through his consulting with that art business. And so together, Anne and Kurt will talk to us about who is dot, 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 and what ICANN stands for and what we can and cannot do with domain names. Anne and Kurt, welcome. Thank you for joining us in Zoom, if not Metaverse, and please tell us about domain names for artists and all. Thanks very much, Rena. I'm, I'm really glad you intervened because I, don't, I didn't think I was going to be able to match Manelli's uh, level of energy. I was trying to figure out how to get it from uh, 33 and a third to 45. And it's, it's for somebody my age, that might not be possible. So on behalf of my colleague, Ann and I, thanks very much for investing some of your time um, to learn about, hopefully, um, the development of the internet and domain names and as a store of information. and um, you know, as attorneys and artists and uh, art and those that work together, um, the conflicts and opportunities that have arose since the internet was first born and um, continues to grow and evolve. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the early days of the internet and then um, and then uh, more pointedly and more meaningfully, um, some of the conflicts and opportunities that have arisen today. So um, I'm not sure I'll be able to see the chat or if anybody raises a hand. So Arena, it's kind of up to you, however you wanna manage that. Um, so I'm gonna give you a brief history of the internet. Hope it's not too boring. So the first message was sent from a node in Southern California to one in Northern California in 1965. It was LO, not as in low, the internet is born, but as in low as in log on, but the system crashed after the first two letters. So. Um, that was the start. Um, Tomlinson in 1971 was sending an email to somebody else and thought he'd address it to the computer with the at symbol. And uh, that was the start of that. Um, there was a strong predilection on the part of all these engineers that the internet would never be put toward commercial use. And when two of the um, several hundred engineers on the net at the time in 1978 decided to send them all an email uh, because they were looking for jobs. Um, that was the first spam. And um, it raised such ire that every single engineer wrote back and crashed those two engineer systems. So it was not only the first spam, it was the first uh, denial of service attack. And all at the same time. Um, in 1984, John Postel wrote what's called a request for, for comment and RFC, which are 
the form of protocols that govern the internet. And he developed the nomenclature for that we currently know in the generic space with, that included .com, .edu, .gov, how that would all work together, second level names. At that time, it was pictured that um, a domain name would have several levels. So, um, you know, .history, .humanities, .stanford, .edu, something like that would be a typical domain name. So it didn't quite grow out that way. Also, um, single letter names were reserved. So A.com, B.com, C.com, because they didn't know whether one top level domain like .com would be able to accommodate, you know, 10,000 domain names or 50,000 domain names. So um, just to be safe, they reserved uh, A and B and C. So they could that in a move that's called extensibility. So the internet could continue to grow, not realizing that .com could, you know, accommodate over a hundred million. Um, names and the very first names you saw were registered there in 1985. Um, at the same time in 1985, um, the first country code names were created, .us, .uk, and .il. And that same fellow, John Postel, that was so responsible for all of this, much of this, um, said, uh, we're not going to invent things. We're going to rely on the um, current code, country codes that are approved by the UN. And so, for example, .us um, is a reserve country code name. And then the second application was .uk. And of course, .uk is not on that list. It's .gb for Great Britain. And uh, John said, well, we'll make an exception. But uh, there's, that, there's never been too much uh, political um, dispute over who's meriting a country code and who's not. And then in 1990, um, the, the World Wide Web was... Um, first developed um, a, the language, um, Tim Berners-Lee developed HTML, a language that allowed the establishment of web spaces. So you could trade and um, store information, not just by sending each other files and emails, but by establishing what we think of as web pages and other forms of DNS files. And uh, that created a way of storing information on the internet that made it um, so useful today. And so um, then the, uh, with, with that advent, the, uh, the use of the internet and the, and the uh, number of domains multiplied. And uh, you see by, by uh, the turn of the century, there were uh, about two and a half million domain names. And, and with, those, um, with those domains came our first set of problems as people sought to uh, take it, you know, gain advantages and monetize uh, the capabilities of the net. So I'll go ahead, Ann. All right. Um, yeah, thank you, Kurt. Um, so as Kurt just noted, we, we saw really an explosion of domain name registrations as people and companies started to stake out internet real estate on the World Wide Web. Um, and the, uh, the thing to really understand about this period of time in the mid 90s when this was happening is that domain names were initially the primary way of navigating the web. If you wanted to find the website for Chanel or the Metropolitan Museum of Art, usually you just had to guess the domain name. You were like, well, I'm, I'm gonna guess that Chanel is at Chanel.com, but you might be wrong. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's Chanel fashion or something like that. So, so we didn't have search engines. We didn't have Wikipedia. We didn't have um, web uh, indices, all of that was still in the future. And people were really, really freaked out about making sure they got the domain name they felt they needed because that, they felt they wouldn't be found on the web if, if they didn't have the right domain name. Um, at the same time, brand owners um, in, the, in the brand owner world, in the commercial world, brand owners were facing all kinds of problems. Um, a lot of companies were a little bit late to catching on to um, the opportunities presented by the web. And so they found that others had registered their brands as the domain name um, and offered to sell it back to them for a usually very high price. Um, other companies or enterprises were registering brands as domain names simply to drive traffic. They were counting on people looking for this brand 
and they figured that um, when somebody typed that domain name in, it would send them to not that brand, but usually something like a porn site. Um, and that's how porn sites initially developed their traffic. Um, then there was the brand sucks.com, which were usually complaint sites. Um, somebody who had a beef with a particular company would uh, launch a website and usually put it under okay. brand sucks. Um, and so on. And so uh, those were some of the initial problems that uh, brand owners were facing in the 90s, uh, kind of mid to late 90s. Now, as time passed, some of those problems went away and changed, and we saw other problems like websites, counterfeiting websites, under also under the domain name of the brand. Um, maybe it was, uh, you know, Chanel Online Store instead of Chanel.com. Um, and there you would find uh, counterfeit Chanel or gray market Chanel or whatever. Um, so uh, the, the first thing that, that a lot of these brands discovered is that trademark infringement suits didn't really work very well in this environment. They were just too slow, they were unwieldy, they were expensive given the massive volume of disputes that were blowing up in the late 90s and early aughts. Um, a lot of times the identities of their registrations and their of the registrants and their locations just weren't known. So you, you couldn't figure out where to sue them, um, where you might have jurisdiction over them. Domain names also just didn't fit neatly into the existing trademark, trademark likelihood of confusion framework um, for establishing infringement. And in fact, the trademark world, the trademark bar in particular, and the engineering world that was still in the space of, hey, we don't want the internet used for commercial purposes. <laughs> and yet that train had left the station. But I mean, these, these two worlds with diametrically opposing views of how the internet should be used started this debate of trademark owners should just get out of the way and not worry about their trademarks being used in domain names. And, and um, uh, because domain names aren't trademark use, they're just addresses and nobody's going to be confused and a bunch of evil IP owners. Um, the IP owners, on the other hand, felt that people were out there using their brands to mislead the public and to trash the brand. So everyone was unhappy. So by the time ICANN was created, because the, at the same time all of this is happening, people are trying to, are recognizing that a bunch of volunteer engineers aren't gonna be able to run the internet anymore <laughs> or the domain name system. Um, and so uh, there were negotiations going on that resulted in the creation of ICANN um, in 1998. Um, and one of the first problems ICANN was assigned to solve was the trademark problem as it had become known. Um, and the International Trademark Association had been kind of lobbying pretty heavily in this area um, and WIPO basically picked up the concerns of the IP community and put together what they felt was a fairly balanced proposal for ICANN's consideration. And the, the result was basically that there be an accurate who is database of registrants so people could figure out who's registered a domain name. Um, and the registra registrants were required to agree to be bound by something called the Uniform Dispute Resolution Policy or the UDRP, which was intended to be a fast, cheap, simple dispute resolution mechanism for the easy cases of bad faith registration, not the complex infringement cases, but the easy cases. More complex cases weren't going to get resolved by this mechanism. Um, but one of the things this, this mechanism did do was result, you know, create a, a, a fast, cheap, easy um, solution for the problem at the time. And it solved the jurisdictional problem because any registrant, no matter who they were, or where they were, if they were registering a domain name, they basically had to agree by contract to abide by this policy. So um, this is just a little more detail on how that uh, how the UDRP works. Um, it was the first ICANN consensus policy. And for those of you who are familiar with ICANN operations, 
ICANN tries to reach consensus on all of its policies through a lot of community uh, socialization of its policies. Um, the UDRP is basically one round of pleadings before a panelist for a fairly low fee, generally resolved in 50, I'm sorry, 60 days. Um, and it's the only remedy available is essentially transfer of the domain name to the complainant, or in some cases, cancellation of the domain name. There are no monetary damages. There's no other relief. Um, and uh, courts, you, know, you can still appeal to a court. Uh, so it's not um, permanently binding, if you will. All right. So next slide, please. Um, actually, I'm, you know, I'm going to skip over this slide. This shows you some statistics of how the UDRP is used, but I'm going to probably refer back to it later. So let's go to elements of the UDRP violation. So this is intended to be simple and easy. The three elements of a UDRP violation are, first, has the registrant registered a domain name that is identical or confusingly similar to somebody's trademark? Um, and here, for those of you who are trademark lawyers in the audience, the confusing similarity analysis is super, super simple. It's not the detailed marketplace analysis that you know from the Polaroid case, et cetera, et cetera. It's basically, is the domain name the same letter string or nearly identical letter string? Um, so it's almost a standing requirement. It's just, it's just that, uh, question of, you know, has if somebody's registered Chanel online store and Chanel objects, Chanel can point to the fact that the Chanel letter string is in this domain name and they've satisfied this requirement. The two more significant issues in these cases are the establishment of bad faith and whether or not the registrant actually has rights or legitimate interests. And these are the more interesting areas of litigation, if you will. Um, the, in early days, the examples of bad faith were, did, did the registrant register primarily to sell the domain name back to the brand owner? Um, that was called cyber squatting. Registered primarily to disrupt the business of a competitor. You'd be amazed how many competitors registered their, the domain names of their other competitors just to make, you know, make trouble. Um, the big one though is registered intentionally to attract for commercial gain, internet users to the web registrant's website by creating a likelihood of confusion with the complainant's mark. And here we're talking about all of those sites that are trying to drive traffic with a misleading domain name, porn sites, counterfeiters, fishers, and so on. Um, and those, that's where most of the bad faith action if, is, if you will. Um, now, the uh, encounter to that, there's the, does the domain, does the registrant have some sort of rights or legitimate interests? And this is intended to deal with situations where two companies may have a similar domain name, but they're in totally different fields. I mean, I'm sorry, a similar trademark, but they're in totally different fields. Um, and so... Uh, they both have rights and legitimate interests, and, and one doesn't necessarily win over the other. Other examples are uh, basically descriptive fair use, nominative fair use, protected speech, and we're going to talk a little bit about this as we move through the slides. So let's go to the next slide. So here's, here's a good example. We have two pretty well-known companies here in the United States that use the mark United. One is United Airlines and one is United Van Lines. And you can see here, looking at their websites, that uh, United Airlines got united.com before United Van Lines did. <laughs> and as a result, United Van Lines um, has uh, registered the domain name unitedvanlines.com. This may seem like no big deal, but um, I can assure you that sometime in the, in the mid to late 90s, there were people at both of these companies really concerned about who was going to get the united.com domain name as opposed to something like united plus descriptors. And, um, and so the way the UDRP would resolve these types of disputes 
is they would not do the full trademark infringement analysis. They would not look at who first used United. Um, they basically said, first come, first serve. If, and if uh, the, the registrant, in this case, United Airlines, has a legitimate interest in the, in the name, then they win because they registered the domain, domain name first. Even if they perhaps used the, the second user of the United trademark, they still got the domain name first. So first come, first serve for legitimate users. Um, and the, the folks that come later, like United Van Lines, well, they've got to come up with something else. Here's another example of legitimate interest. Let's pretend that there is a well-known company out there, Sandy's Home Linens, and they're, they're big in the, um, in the home textile space. And Sandy's Home Linens sees this website and says, ah, oh, they're infringing my trademark. Well, uh, if you take this to a UDRP panelist, there's gonna be the argument that Home Linens is completely descriptive. And even if San, uh, Sandy's has got some trademark rights in Sandy's Home Linens, um, the question is gonna be, did the registrant of homelinens.com uh, register in bad faith? Or do they have a legitimate interest? And the argument will be made that, hey, I'm just using the term home linens in its normal English descriptive meaning um, and not to rip off Sandy's home linens. And so the fact that I'm selling, offering this for sale is not bad faith. So you can see here how legitimate interest versus, uh, plays off of bad faith and vice versa. And in these areas where domain names both function as somebody's trademark somewhere, but are also normal descriptive terms in the language in question, you, you get into these, these questions of legitimate interest versus bad faith. All right, then you get into um, some other areas of fair use and protected speech. And again, this is, these areas tend to be litigated, have been litigated pretty heavily. The, 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 the most well-known EDRP case in this area is a case called okidataparts.com, but you can plug in any brand here, BMW parts, uh, BMW repair, uh, and so on and so on and so on. Um, vintage Chanel, another example. Um, the question here is, is this a good faith um, fair use? In other words, a legitimate interest or is there bad faith going on? The Okidata case, was a case where the registrant was actually um, engaged in selling Oki data parts, genuine Oki data parts. And um, there was nothing in the content of the website that was misleading about that. Um, and in fact, the registrant had been clear to say that they're not Oki data, they're, they're some third party selling Oki data parts. And so it was considered that that was a, that was a legitimate interest and a fair use of the brand and the domain name, and that Okidata couldn't prevent that. Um, and to be a bona fide and legitimate uh, use here, the registrant must be offering the goods or services. They must be using the site to sell only the trademark goods or services uh, so that it's not a bait and switch. Um, the registrant must be accurately, accurately and prominently disclosing the relationship or lack of one with the trademark holder. So here, what you're seeing is, um, you know, is the registrant actually engaging in deceptive conduct or honest conduct under under this brandparts.com? And this this then starts to, you know, be the, the the standard for evaluating a lot of websites that use some third party's brand, but as part of a legitimate business. Um, so. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to um, hand it back to Kurt. We're going to talk a little. I do have here a bunch of links to various um, resources available to you if you want to deep dive on the UDRP and how it works. Um, but I'm going to hand it back to Kurt at this point, and he's going to take you through the next round of history. Yeah, thanks very much, Anne. And and so the the internet can continue to evolve and grow, and so did. Um, rights protection mechanism. So there's uh, new chapters there that we probably won't go into. But in um, 
2000, a new uh, set of TLDs were introduced in addition to the original seven, which were uh, ComNet, Org, uh, EDU, et cetera. And uh, the story there is, uh, it was the early days of ICANN. So the ICANN board invited those who wanted a new TLD to come into a big conference room in the public and each make a pitch for why they should get a P TLD. About 30 groups showed up. Each gave a pitch. The, the uh, ICANN board uh, went in the back room, um, noodled a little, little bit, and chose seven winners. And, and so that's how um, these uh, new TLDs were launched in 2000. In 2005, um, ICANN conducted another round and attempted to limit um, the applicants to sort of a community or sponsored based set of applicants. So you can see .asia.cat is Catalan and, and on. And so um, just seven there, but um, ICANN's real reason for being, one of their reasons for being was to really expand competition and choice in this area. And in 2012, as opposed to the 2000 round, the 2012 applications were governed by a 80,000 word um, tome that was called an applicant guidebook that uh, created all the, the duties and obligations and rights of those um, who wanted a TLD. And as a result, ICANN received over 2,000 applications. And uh, these are a small number of the new TLDs that were um, created as a result of that round. And in fact, um, the, you know, I'll only spend make two small points on this slide that took me like an hour to make. But um, in fact, um, this was the first time um, in the in this namespace that um, internationalized domain names, and you can understand why they're called that, were allowed. So the two points I want to make about this are, are interesting. How does the internet um, read these different scripts? And, and the answer is that every one of these characters is automatically translated into a Latin equivalent, uh, an alphanumeric set of characters. So you know, the B in Cyrillic B is translated into a, a, a set of alphanumeric characters that is done, that is, and that that book, that reference guide is uh, maintained and evolved by the Unicode, Cord Unicode Consortium that Ann works for. So, you know, years ago, we all had our Unicode Code <laughs> Consortium handbook on our desk, which was a war and peace kind of maybe more like a Finnegan's weight kind of uh, tome. We all had that um, provided guidance as to which ones of these characters were actually allowed on the internet. And the other point I want to make is if you look at right, the dead center of the screen, there's a dot com there. So that's in Cyrillic characters. And imagine um, the O in that dot com being used, uh, you know, in, instead of auto.com, that Cyrillic character was plugged in that could uh, mislead you into, into going to a website uh, to which you do not want to go. So that so the IDN, these IDNs introduced more complexification into the into the domain name space. So um, then um, after the 2012 round, things really started to evolve quickly. So um, we started with the net and the, the, the domain name system and the development of the World Wide Web. And really, if you think about it, we have a 50 years of stable, you know, sedate operation. It's a, it's a pretty old, well-established product with predictable usage. And, um, you know, those, those abuse mechanisms that Ann talked about, those are, those are predictable too. And some, but not a lot of inno innovation. And then um, more recently, and, you know, we're not going to spend time to just the, the right amount of time to discuss all this, but um, blockchain, the blockchain uh, was introduced, the online ledger, which is a new way to store um, in, in, information. It's still evolving technically. Um, and as we know, like right at the very second, the markets were evolving rapidly. Um, there's rapid in, innovation. Um, NFTs are related to the blockchain and the development there. And it's, stores information in a way that adds value. And um, now we have what we call 3.0, which is really a way to store information that uses um, blockchain, NFTs, and, and domains. And, and in, a, in a real way, um, clashes with the old domain name system as new domains are introduced outside of the ICANN realm and 
um, there's going to be collisions on this in the very near future. And so we want to um, devote the, the rest of our presentation into uh, two case studies um, that um, illustrate both the pitfalls and, and the opportunities, opportunities associated with um, Web 3.0 and, and um, it, its, uh, its predecessors. So I'll turn it back over to Anne for the first case study. Great, thank you, Kurt. I'm actually gonna go back to Kurt's slide for a moment. Um, if you wouldn't mind going back two slides. Kurt. I might be able to, but uh, yep. Okay. Go back one this more. Yeah, so you see all this expansion of all these domain names. Um, and the expansion, I mean, the, the expansion of domain name real estate was massive. Um, starting in the, two, the beginning of the 2000s and, and through. Interestingly, a lot of these domains are not anywhere near as popular as the sort of the original generic top level domains like .com, .net, et cetera. So they did not generate the same number of domain names in those real, in, in, in those uh, second level domain names in those, in those TLDs, but, but the expansion was pretty massive. And interestingly, even though we have seen an increase over 25, 25, 25, um, in the number of UDRP cases filed, it is nowhere in proportion to the expansion of domain name real estate. Um, and that's for a number of reasons, uh, some of which is that a lot of brand owners now engage in defensive domain name registration for the domain, the trademarks they really care about, so they don't have to use the UDRP. Um, additionally, a lot of brand owners sort of got over it, if you will. <laughs> they, they said, you know what, we're not going to control it. There are going to be some domain names out there that use our trademarks, and we're just not going to worry about it too much unless they're engaging in some very um, deceptive, excessive behavior. So they focus their efforts on things like counterfeiting. Um, and uh, so I think it's it's interesting that even though we've seen uh, a rise in UDRP case UDRP filings over the years, it, it isn't anywhere near in proportion to the increase in domain name real estate. So having said that, um, I'm going to move to a case study as well as a question that I've received in the chat um, that I think is an interesting question. Uh, the question I will share with you all because it was directed just to me was one of the audience members asked. If somebody is operating clearly in bad faith and are clearly being deceptive, but for political protest, is that, a, is, is that an exception? Um, and uh, I think the example given here was um, the uh, example of the yes men who are appropriating the WTO domain and then showing up at the conference pretending to represent the organization as a form of protest. Um, you know, I think this is a good ex a good question. Um, it's not the kind of issue that the UDRP generally uh, likes to resolve um, because it's a tougher question. But the basic principle of the UDRP is, you know, you can kind of do what you want to do on the internet as long as you're not being deceptive and misleading. Um, and uh, and that's kind of the baseline fundamental principle. Um, so uh, my guess is that in a case like this, I don't know that the WTO would have even brought a case like this, um, but, uh, but it would, I would say that there would be, uh, depending on your panelists, this is a situation, this particular situation is one where you could end up with different results depending on the panelists, um, even though there's an enormous amount of consensus around most UDRP questions. Now I want to go to the um, Meta Birkins case. This is for those of you who um, are in either the art or fashion world, you're probably at least passingly familiar with this case. Uh, this is a case that was, um, it's actually court litigation um, in the United States filed by Hermes against um, the artist Mason Roth Rothschild who launched a, this website called metaburkins.com to sell his MetaBirkins NFTs. And you see here a picture of the NFTs. For those of you who are familiar with the fashion world, the Birkin bag is a very famous uh, handbag. 
a very famous, very expensive campaign. <laughs> um, I think it's been around since at least the 50s, maybe longer. Um, it's been um, there, it po popularized by a number of celebrities. Uh, I think some of the most famous pictures of Birkin bags are of Princess Grace carrying hers. She always carried a Birkin bag. Um, and uh, the bags you see here are not, they, these, are, these are NFTs and moreover, there are no Birkin bags that look exactly like these bags because he's covered them in fur for the NFT. So uh, what you're seeing here is not an actual Birkin bag or something that, that looks like any existing Birkin bag, but it's shape is the same the little lock on the front is the same um, but the fur is the fur is the artist's edition and i deep dive on this a little bit because it it really gets into the whole analysis here um Hermes filed a lawsuit against against mason rothschild and uh, he moved to dismiss the case um, and the court recently issued an opinion uh, refusing to dismiss the case there are a number of interesting things about this case, and I'm going to ask you to go to the next slide. Particularly if you are um, a lawyer who represents uh, IP owners. What, for the first thing that's interesting is the claims that are not made here. Um, if, when you first read, if you first read an article in a newspaper about this lawsuit, you might have assumed that Hermes's objection to this was the art itself. The, uh, the creating of the NFTs um, and then selling them. But in fact, that is not what they are objecting to in this lawsuit. They have not made a copyright infringement claim, nor have they made a design rights infringement claim. Um, I can deep dive into why I think those claims were not made, but I will just say at this point that Mason Rothschild has a pretty good argument that the, um, the depictions of furry Hermes handbags probably is sufficiently transformative to, to basically make it uh, protected free speech art as opposed to um, an infringement of any copyright that Hermes may have in the design of the bags. So Hermes focused on trademark claims and the real questions here are, um, do we have trademark infringement? And what I want to do here is contrast this to, do we have a UDRP violation? Because one of the things Mason Rothschild has done is use metaburkins.com as his domain name. Um, but uh, Hermes goes beyond objecting to just the domain name in the lawsuit. They also object to the creation of the mark metaburkins. Um, and the use of that metaburkins mark to sell the NFTs. And so there are lots of questions here. Um, the claims that have been made are, do we have trademark infringement or protected speech? Uh, do we have cyber squatting? Do we have trademark dilution? Do we have an other general misappropriation or unfair competition claim? And, um, and the uh, motion to dismiss, uh, the court, um, denied the motion to dismiss. And, and what the court really looked at here was on the trademark infringement claim, there's something called the Rogers test from a prior case. Um, and in, where you have art that is, um, and you are naming the art, you're the titling the art, whatever the art is, using somebody else's trademark because the art itself somehow is relevant, I mean, under that trademark, um, then the, the, the title, the use of the trademark in the title of the art becomes artistically relevant. Um, and then the next prong of the test is, even if it's artistically relevant and therefore might be protected speech, is it explicitly misleading? Has the artist titled the art in a way that um, still could mislead or confuse the consumer. So what you can see here is, is that the artist in, in the Meta Birkins case has titled his art Meta Birkins. He's incorporated Bir the Bir famous Birkin trademark into the title of the art. Is it artistically relevant? Maybe because the art itself is um, essentially a comment on the Meta Birkin, on the, on the Birkin bag. 
but is it explicitly misleading? And this is what the court really looked at closely and what, what Hermes has sort of pounded home in this case, which is Mason Rothschild has gone out in the world and just commented up one wall and down the other using the Birkin trademark saying he did this to basically create more Birkins for people. <laughs> um, and so there's an argument that Hermes is making that, that really what this guy is doing is free writing off of our mark. He's not actually creating real art, he's free writing off of our brand and, and creating a commercial opportunity for himself to sell these NFTs. Um, he of course disputes that um, and it's, it's a complex factual record and we don't know how the case will come out. What we do know is the court felt that Hermes had pled enough facts of explicit, explicit misleadingness to allow the case to proceed. And, and so it is proceeding. Now, I, I think just to tie this back to the UDRP, here's, you know, it was this UDRP violation. Could Hermes have avoided this giant lawsuit and just filed a UDRP claim? to reclaim the metaburkins.com domain name. Um, here, just running through the analysis, the domain name it would be considered confusingly similar. It incorporates the Birkin letter, letter string. Um, but the potential that the domain name might be protected speech under the fair analysis we just talked about, the Rogers test, would mean that the complaint would almost certainly fail on the rights and legitimate interest test or the bad faith test. A panelist would say, look, there's an argument here that this is protected speech and that's a legitimate interest. Um, and I think most panelists, perhaps all, would refrain from deciding such a novel question in a UDRP claim. Um, the decision there would probably say, we, uh, <laughs> We think Hermes should go to court and fully litigate this question. We're not prepared to do it. We think there's enough of a legitimate interest there that we're not going to take the domain name away from the registrar. So while Hermes did not file a UDRP claim, I think that's how it would have come out. And I think they knew that. <laughs> um, and so uh, they did not use that, uh, that tool in their toolbox, but instead are pursuing a trademark case. And um, I, I have to um, jump in with one question. We have, if, if that's okay. Thank you for putting Rakov's um, text in the denial of motion. Here's my question. So Birkins.com is available. It's not registered. And MetaBirkins.art is available, not registered. So if uh, Mason Rothschild says that he's creating work of art, should he be using a different domain name? Well, it, with a few exceptions, and Kurt could probably speak to this better than I could, but with a few exceptions, most, most generic top-level domains um, do not have specific parameters around whether you can register there or not. In other words, they're open. There are definitely exceptions, and certainly the CCTLDs, the country code top-level domains, often require the registrant to be in that country or doing business in that country before they can qualify to use that domain. But for a lot of, and I, I don't know if .art has, um, has, uh, is open or has parameters, but I'm assuming it's open. And um, so, uh, I mean, certainly he could have registered metaburkins.art, um, kind of his choice. Uh, I think m a lot of people who are trying to sell stuff prefer .com because it's sort of the default top level domain and he is trying to sell stuff. So, um, but it, it, I don't think it would affect the legal analysis either way. Thank you. Um, so Kurt, can you tell us about the .art case study? Sure, are you, are you okay with that, Anne? Mm -hmm. Yep. I, so, I will just, actually, I will just finish up with, I've got a few quotes here from, from the uh, Hermes case where in the motion to dismiss, um, the denial of the motion to dismiss, but the full case is, if you're interested in this, well worth reading the opinion. Um, and I believe uh, Irina shared the link to it, but um, it's readily available online. And there you go, Kurt. Yeah, thank, thanks. Yeah, and I'll point out that dot art and most TL, the so-called TLDs are open. So, uh, you know, I, 
the mere registration of a name is an infringement. It's it's how it's used, although um, in a very fanciful in, in a very fanciful name, uh, it can be a strong innovator of that. So um, um, the dot art domain name registry is seeking to take advantage of um, aspects of the evolvement of the internet um, to create some opportunities for artwork owners um, to enhance the value of their artwork by storing information on it. And so, you know, I'll start with this, the story of Salvador Monday that sold for, you know, $60, $60 in 1958. And they cleaned it up and did some research and found out, you know, it dated to the 16th century and sold for $10,000. And then uh, more, more research uh, uncovered images below the painting in a style reminiscent of masters and um, the school of Leonardo and the price jumped in 2013 to 75 million it was turned around and resold right away for 127 million in a in sort of a scandalous resale so uh, it's not just information that increases the artwork value but uh, scandal also uh, does it and then recently as you know it sold for a half a billion dollars and then um, more information came to light that that uh, in the, that uh, let us think maybe it wasn't an actual Leonardo da Vinci painting. So you know what, you know the painting stayed the same the, the whole time, right? What's what what changed here was the information about it, and it's information that makes artwork valuable. You know what makes a black rectangle or a commode worth millions of dollars? It's not the well. I'm I'm not going to besmirch the uh, the beauty of the artwork, but but it's the information behind it. It's the it's the artist, um, it's the artist or the time or the age or something. And the, the question there then is how, how is our works, you know, information stored, you know, the art industry, as you know, better than I operates largely the way it did uh, hundreds of years ago, right with uh, file drawers with information. And so, you know, to really jump ahead, um, there's a way to tie domain names to individual artworks instead of uh, organizations or individuals. And so with each artwork assigned uh, a domain name, then the domain name transfers when the artwork is sold. And this, uh, this transfers and the information stored within the domain name provides you know, a chain of custody or form of, of providence. And so, there's there's an idea here. I'll 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 explain a little in graphically a little bit better later. But um, when you register a domain name, you have to enter an, a bunch of information about the registrant of that domain name. That's called who is. So um, we leverage that to store metadata about the artwork. And then it's a domain name, right? So you can have a website with images of the artwork or a data file for three D uh, printout or all sorts of information. And then um, we marry that with um, blockchain transactions and NFTs to establish a trustworthy chain of custody. So how does it work? So this is a, one of these domains these, the, that we call digital art digital twin um, that's been registered to um, display this digital artwork. And, and if you were look, to look up the um, who is information there, it not only includes the information about the registrar, the registrant, and all you know, the name server addresses, but there's additional who is data fields, which makes it a very special kind of domain that records the meta data about the artwork. So this is the metadata of the artwork is stored in the who is data that's um, part of the, it's not really the domain name system, but it's a independently ma maintained um, database. And why this information? Well, this is, this is information that was developed by the Getty Foundation and ICOM to identify artworks way back in the 1900s. But um, that's evolving. And there's a, a new group called Art Identification Standard that's evolving these, um, these identifiers. And then um, coincident with the domain name registration, um, blockchain transactions are triggered that um, stores the same sort of information. So um, as of now, we're partnering with Ethereum um, to create these blockchain transactions. Um, the .r registry provided these blockchain transactions for free initially when they cost 60 cents, but now they cost $60. So um, it's more up to the artwork owner if they want to store that information in the blockchain too. And then 
each time the artwork sold, um, the domain name owner changes and that triggers a new blockchain transaction. And then um, that creates the chain of custody that uh, continues to um, enhance the value of the artwork. So this is, uh, this is my painting, not one that I met, made, but um, one that I bought in Australia. So it's Aboriginal art. And if you look at the domain name, um, you'll see the, uh, the NFT logo in the upper right-hand corner. So you can see where uh, I've minted an NFT um, for this artwork. And it's just, um, you know, I, per I minted that at the prices that Ethereum charges. Um, it's not a, a dot .art sale, really. A dot .art is just the coordinator of all this information. And so the architecture of, of this uh, scheme is this, that... Um, an art object, um, you know, create a digital twin first using the DNS by registering a domain name where the registration data, the who is data stores that object ID information and the DNS can store whatever you want because it's your website and you can do whatever you want. And then um, in parallel, um, block, blockchain transactions um, are, are uh, created that um, store the chain of custody and um, NFTs can be minted too. So instead of the um, DNS and blockchain being in competition here, we're looking for where they can be, where they can work together. And so um, what, what's the opportunity here? And I love the slide because, you know, what do kids do when they go to a museum? They look at their phones. But um, <clears throat> The premise uh, at the outset, which we could spend a long time on, is how um, information and how it's reliably stored and passed on is what creates real value for artwork. And so this digital twin is an opportunity for artists or artwork owners um, to enhance the resale value um, by providing evidence of provenance and chain of custody and also authenticity. Um, it also provides a, a, an avenue for uh, monetization prior to sale. So selling subscriptions to digital artworks uh, for display and uh, sharing the NFT and the like. And it's, and it's uh, value because domain names are, are pretty darn cheap. And so it's much less than the value of even a moderately priced artwork. And for people in my business, the domain business, it's exciting because uh, you know, the certain museums, instead of registering one domain, might register hundreds of thousands. And um, because this adds value to artwork, there's a high renewal rate. So it's good for the domain name industry, too. So I think um, I kind of accelerated that. But um, that's all that's all I have. And uh, I want to thank you. And I guess we might have a minute or two for questions. So I'm going to stop sharing and see if there's any questions or any questions in the in the pod. Thank you, Kurt. I have a couple of questions for you as well. And I know the time is running short. So um, if, if Anne and Kurt, you don't mind staying a little bit past the hour, um, we're happy to take more questions um, shortly. So Kurt, here's a question for you. I'm on .art website, get .art domain. And imagine, I'm imagining who would use Leonardo.art? Would it be a museum that collects Leonardo da Vinci's works or a museum that um has his archives or Christie's for promoting another last lost Leonardo or Leonardo DiCaprio who gets to have Leonardo.art domain name right or the it's Ninja Turtle guy yet. right so so um That's they're right. they're all they're all legitimate uses of um the domain and and um and there's a legitimate uses too right to to gain, say, whatever rights are, you know, whatever rights are in, in with Leonardo are probably long gone, but um, each registry approaches that in its own way. What Dot Arts tried to do is reserve those famous art names, names of museums, um, tr certain trademark names, um, names of favorite famous artists whose estate might want them. And um, and uh, we've reserved those. And more often than not, if, if we're contacted by the estate, we'll say, if you, if you use this art, art name, we'll give it to you for free because it's great advertising for us. So um, we've taken some measures outside the norm to try to get the right name in the right hands, but it's really, uh, it's really up to how each TLD operator controls its own, uh, its own space. I hope that's sort of an answer. Yeah, 
And to, to add to what Kurt just said, I mean, the fundamental thing here is, is if there is a legitimate interest in the domain name, even if there's also a rights holder, if the registrant has a legitimate interest, it's first come, first serve. Um, and in one thing Kurt's group is doing here is also reserving certain domain names, but to, to give to the owner as opposed to sell to the owner, <laughs> um, which basically removes any potential bad faith. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if we have any questions in the audience. Um, it seems that if we go back at one of the slides where you heard um, showed us from the web, I guess, point one to web point three or 3.0, we have touched on the subject of NFTs because they've been such hot ticket items for the last year and a half. We looked at the blockchain, but, um, and we might be going back in time rather than going forward, but I, the way that the digital twin idea came about, can you talk a little bit more about it um, for our audience? So, so the founder of that art is Ovi Kazimov. This is going to be, I don't know if this is going in a good place or not, but um, he's been successful in um, looking across places and finding industries or organizations or environments that require infrastructure. And um, like I said before, the art industry in many ways operates the way it has for um, hundreds of years. And he, that, that struck him and coincident with that was ICANN's introduction of new TLDs. And so that was sort of a aha moment for him that, that this domain name space could be um, used to bring some infrastructure into the art space. And the big idea was really more about um, this digital twin and the, the way of uh, making information about artwork more successful, more accessible. So really more than that than even just um, domain name registrations. And, you know, serendipitously or un unserendipitously, um, while this was all being developed in the DNS, blockchain and NFTs came to be. So um, the product sort of evolved to include them, which is uh, good. So we have this partnership with Ethereum where, uh, we, we, you know, dot art is up in the, you can get a dot art name in Ethereum as well as the DNS. But anyway, so it was really, this was really the driver. Digital Twin was the driver behind the dot art domain and not, not just selling domain names. I don't know if it's just me because I've listened to the preparatory calls, but I feel like you are making this very complicated topic very clear to us. So I, I'm so <laughs> that would be the first time ever. Thank you. Well, um, the first time we talked about domain names and law, I thought we can't possibly. And I'm. Do we have any more questions from the audience? Because I think if there are no questions, you guys have demystified the entire. How many millions of websites are there? Three hundred and some odd million domain names. I know. All right. Um, I do think, uh, to your point, Irina, that that we have we have in certain places chosen to s completely skip over certain <laughs> highly technical deep dives we could take either on the law or on how the internet works, or we've we've not touched on the sale of domain names for profit in what's called the domaining world. Um, we have not touched. There are lots of things we haven't touched on, and obviously, if there's interest, people should feel free to follow up or do their own further research. Yeah, and, um, and I, I'd like to answer Rachel's question about um, partnering with museums. So certainly, in some cases, we are. Um, there's some hurdles um, when you buy a domain name. Um, you have to pay ICANN a 38 cents or something like that of every domain name sale. And even with us giving away domain names for free, a uh, museum with 700,000 artworks isn't gonna be able to afford um, that sort of cost. So we're, we're looking of ways to partnering with um, museums and also getting some relief on regulatory fees so that um, this, this sort of innovation can um, can more easily proliferate. So yes, we're and and any help anyone wants to wants to provide, and as far as um, museums that might be interested in um, learning more about this, uh, I'd be excited. 
Thank you very much. Um, also, if you're interested in trying that art domain names, uh, Center for Art Law has been offered a little discount for our uh, members. Um, Center for Art Law purchased one dot art domain name, 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 but we haven't used it because um, we don't know how to do everything that we want to do, but we're planning to at least point from one domain name to another. And we might need a workshop on <laughs> domain name uses and updates. Um, I'm very curious about the sale of a work of art. So let's say Salvador Mundi had a domain name, salvadormundi.art. And when the painting sold at Christie's for that half a billion dollars, um, the domain name would have been sold theoretically together with the work of art. Who would then and how go in and update the record? The original creator or the subsequent owner? Is that very onerous or is that that's technical and easy that's right so um you know first of all domain names are just another door to the same information so um you know you can create a shorter domain name and just read it with a dot r name and redirect it so bank of america for example has bank b of a dot art that focuses on their art collection they also have another domain for it that's really long um so that's an e so that art isn't looking to replace .coms, it's looking to just provide another door to the same um, information. So there's no, there's no law about how the domain name transfers with the uh, uh, art object, except that um, the seller and the owner are both, both have incentives to complete that because the seller is saying, my artwork is worth more because look at how great this information is stored and it's gonna be beneficial to you and the, the new owner has the same incentive to take on the the uh, the domain name. So the uh, Saudi Arabian billionaire guy not only got a painting, he got he would get a little domain name. And uh, but um, it's a it's a simple matter of uh, transferring the domain name. That's that's handled by registrars. And as Anne said, uh, you know that's another short that's another short course, but not a not a tough one. Thank you. It's um, covered by the contract. It's it's simple contract. I just and, did my and last it's an opportunity for, for smart Poon. contracts too, right? With NFTs and smart contracts. Um, that's the here we're get, I'm getting beyond my understanding here, but um, that 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 can the the minting of the NFT can include the this this uh, the requirement for this uh, sort of uh, transfer. Um. Thank you. I just looked at Jeff Kuhn's that art domain name. It seems to be sold, but it's not being used. It's um, available for repurchase. So I think there is a, a squatter out there with the domain name that Jeff Kuhn's might be interested in acquiring or turning over. Um, I don't see any more questions from our audience members. Um, so Anne and Kurt, many thanks for working with us on this topic. And many, many thanks to our team, to Blake Kunkel and to Jane, I don't think she, yes, Jane Kinzella who is on this call and many thanks to Manelli for making this event possible. Uh, we look forward to seeing you perhaps tomorrow if you want to talk about artist trust, um, but we are definitely looking forward to seeing you again in real time, um, not only in Metaverse or on Zoom, uh, but if you have questions um, or suggestions on how we can improve this series, or if you want to talk to Anne and Kurt further, please let us know. We're sending you our follow-up materials. And I'm looking forward to um, rethinking about the domain names um, as, men, as a, the mini Birkins case continues pending. Thank you so much. See you soon. Thanks very much.